Well, I'm going to do this standing up. Uh, my name is William Stout. Uh, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, but pretty much uh, grew up in the Los Angeles area. I was born in Salt Lake City on the way to LA. And grew up in the uh, Reseda part of the San Fernando Valley. Went to Reseda High School my first year, and then my family moved to the Thousand Oaks area, and I went to Thousand Oaks High School and graduated from T.O. High. And then went, uh, let's see, I, I graduated in 1967, and that weekend that I graduated, I moved to Culver City, and the following Monday I started art school, uh, hmm. CalArts. Uh, back then it was in downtown Los Angeles, across the street from MacArthur Park. Uh, we referred to it by its old name, the Chouinard Art Institute. It was the school that trained all the Disney artists back in the 30s which is why Walt Disney left the, the bulk of his fortune to CalArts when he passed on. He was always really grateful to Madame Chouinard for training his, his artists. And in fact, the animation department uh, was taught by the nine old men. So I, used, I was an illustration major, but I was also a big animation buff. I used to sneak into the animation department and watch Pinocchio and the other animated features. Because back then, that was when the animated features for Disney were on the seven-year cycle, so you could only see them every seven years, but they were shown regularly in that class. Hmm. So that, was, that was a big fight. They had a great policy at my art school in the illustration department. That is, if we got any real jobs in the outside world, we could turn them in in lieu of our homework. So hmm. by my third year, everything I was turning in was real jobs, so it made the transition from the academic world to the real world absolutely seamless. It was great. Uh, 1968, I, I count that as the start of my career because that was uh, the first time I was able to support myself for my art. And I won a contest uh, doing a cover for a magazine called Coven 13. It was a little pulp magazine that had uh, short stories about witchcraft, supernatural, werewolves, vampires and stuff. And uh, I did the first four covers and illustrated all four issues. And it was a national magazine, so I was, I was very excited. But at that time, I was doing every job that came along uh, just to make ends meet. So I did the very first advertising in this country for Toyota. Hmm. And I did uh, a series of posters uh, for Taco Bell to convince uh, white people that it was safe to eat Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was back when Taco Bell's tacos were a quarter apiece, or five for a dollar. Hmm. So then uh, I worked in a whole bunch of different fields of illustration, and I also uh, was hired by Russ Manning to be his assistant on the Tarzan of the Apes Sunday and daily strips for the newspapers. Uh, that was a tremendous learning experience. I, I learned an enormous amount from Russ. And then 1972, I was hired by Harvey Kurtzman and Willie Elder to help them out with Hank Little Annie Fanny for Playboy. And I learned a lot from Kurtzman and Elder as well. Um, in the mid-70s, I started to gravitate towards doing movie posters, and I ended up working on the ad campaigns for about 120 motion pictures. Uh, one of my most famous images to this date is the poster that I did for the Ralph Bakshi film, Wizards. Hmm. It's, it's still a real popular icon in my career. And one of the best days of my life was I, was, I had a studio on La Brea Avenue, and I was driving to my studio, and there was a construction site, and overnight, they had plastered that construction site with about 2,000 of my wizard posters. It was awesome. <laughs> so the studio I had, we were talking about a little while ago, I shared with uh, Richard Hescox, who did uh, paperback covers for DAW, and Dave Stevens. Uh, Dave had just, had just been working as an animator for Hanna-Barbera and some other animation companies. And he wanted to do his own comic, uh, which became The Rocketeer. And uh, after Dave left the studio, his place was filled by Paul Chenevith, who created Concrete in that studio. So the studio had a really nice, rich legacy. He had a, just a, a regular parade of uh, the best talents of, in film and writing and, and art going through our studio. I remember uh, Richard Hescox went to Art Center, which was our, our rival. And he was one year ahead of these two guys that he had become friends with. And they used to come visit the studio on a regular basis. And, and they were roommates. And one of them was uh, Jim Gurney, who went on to create Donatopia. And Jim Gurney's roommate at the time was Thomas Kincaid. Huh. So, 
didn't like him from the start. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the meanest people I've ever met hmm. in my life, actually. Uh, hmm. So, uh, it's funny, I, I've done 45 feature films, but the, the film business and the advertising of the films, those two worlds never meet. I, in all the films that I've worked on, I've never been asked to do the poster, and, hmm. which I, I find sort of strange. But uh, around 1978, 1978's when I did my first film, I was working with a comedy group that was popular in Los Angeles, but also actually around the rest of the country called the Fireside Theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a film called Everything You Know Is Wrong. And we did it in, in kind of a funny way. We recorded the album first, and then we shot the movie to the record. Hmm. So we usually you, you dump the sound in later after you've shot stuff, but we did just the, just the reverse. But my first real film experience came in uh, 1979. A friend of mine, Bob Greenberg, was working as a uh, production assistant on Conan the Barbarian. Now, I was a big Conan fan. I'd read all the Robert E. Howard books. I loved the Frazetta paintings. And, and I, I found out that uh, Ron Cobb, the political cartoonist, was the production designer for the film. And that just mystified me, because I, I only knew Ron from his political stuff. I'd seen a few of the Star Wars aliens that he had designed for the Cantina sequence. And, uh, and I was familiar with his work on Alien. He designed the Nostromo. Hmm. But uh, I thought it was a strange fit. Ron Cobb and Conan the Barbarian. I was dying to see what he was doing. But I was so busy doing posters, I just didn't have time to get over to the offices. I finally got a break in my schedule. Instead of going over to the Conan offices, I went to the ABA, which is a, a national book fair that's held every year, either usually New York or Los Angeles, sometimes Las Vegas, sometimes Chicago, usually New York, New York or LA. And that year it happened to be in LA. And it is every publisher and every editor in the entire country all in one spot. So for an illustrator, it's a great place to bring your portfolio and pick up illustration jobs. And I walked into the ABA, and the first person I ran into was Ron Cobb. <laughs> and Ron said, look, uh, you're the person I want most to work with on Conan, but I have this agreement with John Millis, the director. And that agreement is basically he has veto power over anybody I want to bring into the art department. And I have veto power over anybody he would like to bring into the art department. So he said, would you mind dropping off your portfolio so that John can see it? I said, oh, it sounds like fun to see how movies are made. And so I, I went in the next day, it was a Friday, and John happened to be there. And he looked through my portfolio. He remembered a story I'd done for Heavy Metal. Was, I was the first American artist to work for Heavy Metal magazine. Mm. And John had really liked that story. Then he flipped quickly through the rest of it, handed me back my book. And John's a sort of bigger than life dramatic kind of guy, and as he's walking out the door over his shoulder, he said, Hi, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in to talk to Buzz Feitchens, our live producer, and uh, he told me what I was going to be making on the film, and I nearly fell off the chair laughing, because it was about 10% of what I was making in advertising. Hmm. But I thought, well, it's only for two weeks. It'll be interesting just to see part of the behind-the-scenes process of making movies. Well, the two weeks turned into two years, and turned into a film career, and, and as hard as it is to get into the movie business, it's even harder to get out. <laughs> so, I worked on Conan the Barbarian for, uh, gosh, the first two years, it was just me and Rob Cobb for the entire art department, me and Cobb in a room. And, and actually, that's the best two years I've ever spent in the film business. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron is a real genius, and I don't use that term very often. Uh, but he is like a fountain that gushes great ideas all day long. Stop. And me being a competitive person, I found that really stimulating and invigorating. It really kept me on my toes and at the top of my game. After Conan, I did uh, First Blood, the first Rambo film. And then I did a second Conan film, and then I started doing a whole lot of different movies. I mentioned that earlier I worked for Canon Films. I did uh, Invaders from Mars and Masters of the Universe. Uh, my first film as a production designer was this little tiny horror film cost a million and a half, called Return of the Living Dead, hmm. which has now become this gigantic cult movie. Every time it, it plays in LA, it completely sells out. And uh, it's, it's more popular today than when it was released. That was written and directed by Dan O'Bannon, who I met at Ron Cobb's house. Uh, Dan and Ron were very close friends. Uh, Ron was the, the original designer for Alien, back when Alien was going to be this tiny little low-budget film. And O'Bannon 
I, I used to bring my work, my current work that I was doing outside of Conan to Ron's parties. And Dan would always take a keen interest in the work. And what I didn't know is, is he was sizing me up to be the production designer for the film. Hmm. And uh, when it came time to make that movie, he gave the Graham Henderson, the line producer, a very short list. It was just two names. Uh, his first choice as production designer was Bernie Wrightson, mm -hmm. and uh, I was number two. Uh, Graham Henderson quickly did his homework, found out that I had already wrapped up uh, a number of film credits and that Bernie hadn't yet. And so he didn't even call Bernie. He lied to Dan and said, well, Bernie passed on it, but I got Bill. <laughs> So that was, uh, I was pretty green, I, but I learned an enormous amount of production design in that first film. I'm a hands-on production designer. I'm on the set every day. I'm, uh, in, in that particular film, uh, for example, uh, in the scene with the half corpse, I was under the gurney operating her spine, making it flop around and lose spinal fluid. And uh, <laughs> there was a scene where the gas that reanimates dead things gets loose in the medical supply warehouse and so I came up with this idea and I, I bought a book on butterflies and I cut out all the butterflies and then I, I made a butterfly from that collection and took the paper butterflies and, and stuck pins through them and um, uh, on screen, on camera, it looked like real butterflies. And then I stood behind the camera and when all the dead stuff started coming back to life, I had a, a card that I fanned the butterflies with and so that made their wings flutter. Hmm. So I was also the, the, the alcoholic bum that the punk stepped over <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> so when I started on Conan, it was really interesting because uh, John Milius, our director, was just finishing up the job of producing another film for a friend of his, Steven Spielberg, who was producing 1941. So Steven was wrapping up 1941 and then starting to kick around ideas for his next project. So Ron Cobb and I would work on Conan during the day, and at 6 o'clock, put our pencil down, run over to Stephen's office, and kick around ideas for his next project, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hmm. So I ended up working on that picture, too. So I, I, it was, boy, we had this really bright gal as our receptionist when I started on Conan. And within two weeks, she was John Millius's personal assistant. Within two months after that, she was Steven Spielberg's personal assistant. And then two years later, she produced E.T., and that was Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> so I've never seen anyone rise faster. It was pretty extraordinary. Uh, I've always been a really huge movie nut. I used to see every movie that came out. And I'd go to film festivals, I'd go to movie marathons where you enter the theater Friday night and don't leave until Sunday night watching 24-7 you know, movies. And I was in, living in Hollywood, I was walking up the sidewalk, I was real excited because I was going to see some new movie, and a friend of mine spotted me from his car, pulled over and said, hey Bill, what you doing? And I said, oh, I'm going to go see this movie, I can't wait to see this, this film. And he, and he looked at me like I was some kind of schmuck, <laughs> and he said, huh, going to see a movie, two hours alone in the dark. <laughs> you could be having your own adventures instead of watching someone else's. And boy, that just flipped the switch in me. And from that moment on, hmm. I began to schedule adventures around the world. Hmm. Uh, and the first one being, uh, I took the money that I got for the Wizards movie poster, and I went to the Galapagos Islands, and uh, Lima, Peru, and Machu Picchu. And then hmm. every year after that, I would go to a different place in the world. And, uh, do exciting things, and uh, I, I still do it to this day. The best place I ever went was Antarctica. I went to Antarctica first as a tourist because I, I found out uh, that the treaty that protects Antarctica was due to expire. This was 1989, and the treaty was going to expire in 1991, and I thought, if I don't get down there, I might, might not have a chance to see it as a tourist. Uh, the treaty was this remarkable document that came out of the International Geophysical Year. That was 1956, 1957. It was a year of international cooperation amongst all the scientists of the world. And it was so successful that President Eisenhower did not want to see that spirit of international cooperation end. And so he came up with the Antarctic Treaty, which states that no country owns Antarctica. All wildlife is protected. Mm. There's no commercial exploitation of the continent allowed, no mining, no oil drilling. All information is shared, even at the height of the Cold War, 
the Soviets could come to any of our stations, look at what we were doing, and we could do the same with them. Mm -hmm. So it was this little oasis of sanity in the world. And I had all these books by the world's greatest photographers uh, on Antarctica, and they said they all said the same thing. Try as they could, they couldn't capture the color of what was down there because of the limitations of the chemical emotions. And I thought, wow, as an artist, I don't have that limitation. Anything I see, I can put down on the paper. So that made me eager and keen to see what was down there. Now, when I, before I was going down there, I told people, you know, they'd say, you know, where's your next trip? I'd say, Antarctica. And they'd say, oh, bring lots of white. Or, or they'd say, uh, oh, why do you want to go down there? It's just a bunch of snow and ice. Well, when I got down there, I was not prepared for how spectacular the place was. It was the most dramatic and amazing place I've ever been to in my life. Uh, the colors in, were absolutely incredible. I was on the deck of the ship, and it was midnight, but it was still light enough for me to paint. And the sky went from a lime green to an apricot orange. The sea was mint green, and there were blue violet icebergs in the distance. And then just to the left of the ship, uh, just below the surface of the water uh, on this iceberg, there was a bright lemon yellow light emanating. It's just absolutely incredible. I've never seen anything like that. And I thought, you know, I can't go back and face my kids without doing something to help preserve this place. And ironically, it was the United States that was not going to re-sign the treaty to protect Antarctica because the first President Bush wanted to open it up for oil drilling. Mm -hmm. So I thought, boy, as long as the American public thinks it's just a bunch of snow and ice down there, they're not going to care if that happens or not. So I, on the ship, I came up with the idea of doing a one-man show of paintings that depicted the beauty and grandeur of Antarctica, and to make sure that every kid dragged their parents to see the show, I made half the show prehistoric Antarctica with dinosaurs. And as soon as I got hmm. back, I flew to Columbus, Ohio to the Bird Polar Research Center and got a crash course in Antarctic paleontology and uh, began to do the paintings. I did the first five paintings and then invited the director of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, Dr. Craig Black, over to see the paintings. He looked at the pictures and he said, you got your show, and we're going to travel for you. So they traveled the exhibition for seven years. Mm -hmm. Pressure was put on President Bush, and he resigned the treaty, which protects Antarctica for another 50 years. Uh, but for me, that's not good enough. I want to protect it forever. So I've been working with a group called the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition. It's a small, tiny little umbrella group based in Washington, D.C. that's coordinating all the activities of groups like Greenpeace, Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund to make Antarctica the very first world park. Uh, mm. So basically that would just be extending the Antarctic Treaty forever and, and protecting the continent forever. So after I did those 45 paintings, you know, I, previous to that I, I subscribed to what I call the pinball school of career planning. I would just sort of bounce all over the place doing all kinds of different things. I guess I have a short attention span. But when I was doing the Antarctic pictures, suddenly I felt like I'd come home, like this was what I was meant to do with my life, and, and I felt like, oh, I could do this forever. And I didn't want to stop, so I decided I would continue painting Antarctica, and uh, as a book project, uh, the, the subject of which will be Antarctica, the history of life of Antarctica from early prehistoric times to the present day, uh, with 100 oil paintings. And so far, I think I'm up to about number 76 now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will probably be, be my most important book, and uh, it's the one my publisher, John Fuskies, wants to publish the most. Uh, after I decided that, I found out that there was a grant that was available from the National Science Foundation. It's called the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program Grant, and every year they pick one or two artists, writers, and photographers to go down and live in Antarctica and do what they do best, either take pictures or write about the place or uh, do paintings. And so I applied for that grant, and I, I got that grant, and I got to live uh, for four months in Antarctica. I spent two months based at McMurdo Station, which is our largest station down there. There's about 1,200 people there during the Antarctic summer, which is our winter. And then uh, two months uh, based at Palmer Station, which is our smallest station. There's only 39 people there because there's only 39 beds at the station. And I got to, to uh, climb an active volcano, Mount Erebus, and, and from the lip of the volcano, I could look down inside and see lakes of lava. Also, when I was acclimatizing on Mount Erebus at the 10,000 foot level, 
I saw what are called neck raised clouds. And these are gigantic cumulus clouds, but because it's so cold there, uh, it, was, it was minus 10 as we were acclimatizing. Mm. The, the little water vapor <coughs> droplets freeze and turn into crystals, but they still stay suspended in the air as mm. clouds. But they act like prisms. And so what you get are these big undulating mother of pearl displays of iridescent color mm. in the clouds. It's absolutely spectacular. And I don't think you can see it anywhere else on Earth. I also got to explore some ice caves at the top of Erebus too, which the color it looked like stained glass. It was just amazing with these incredibly delicate uh, ice and frost uh, stalactites. I got to camp out in the dry valleys. There's these big expanses of, of Antarctica that are completely free of snow and ice, and they're just big deserts. And I was able to camp out in those deserts and, and take hikes there. And then I did uh, seven scuba dives underneath the ice as well. My second scuba dive, uh, we were diving in what's called a seal crack. And that's a, 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 just a natural fissure in the ice. Uh, that Liddell seals go in and out of. And we found one that seemed like a likely place to dive. And the first two divers went in, and about a minute later they shot out of the water, followed by this big bull seal. Mm. That, that was his crack. <laughs> <laughs> so we found another one that was seal free, and, uh, and the first two divers went down. They were, they were down for about 30, 45 minutes. And when they came back, I said, well, you know, is it worth suiting up and diving? It's, it is spectacular. It's godlike. It's cathedrals of ice. So I said, okay, I can't wait to see this. So I suited up and I went down with two other divers. And uh, diving in Antarctica is the best diving in the entire world. On a good day in the Great Barrier Reef or in the Bahamas, uh, visibility, visibility is 120 feet. In Antarctica, the visibility is 1,200 feet. It's clearer than the air in this room. Mm -hmm. it is, you feel like you're, you're flying through thick air. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, the intense cold makes creatures tend towards gigantism too. So that when I was diving, there were I was diving with ten foot tall sponges, uh, purple scallops the size of dinner plates, uh, these gigantic sea spiders. Uh, there were these big mats of uh, they looked like deflated hoses, and they were worms. And I was hmm. cautioned beforehand not to touch the worm because they're covered in this mucus that's real acidic, and it would eat right through your gloves. Hmm. So yeah, the diving was, was absolutely unbelievable. So we found this, this second crack and, and I went in with the second team of divers. And after about half an hour, one of the gals signaled to me that she was cold, she had to go up. Now because it's so clear, they, they have ropes with flags on them going down to the bottom because it, the clarity can trick you into not knowing exactly where you are and you can drift away without knowing it. And so she, she went back up and out and I thought, well, I don't want to be the last guy out, so I swam over to the rope and I went up to the rope. But instead of where the crack should have been for me to get out, there's a little narrow crack just big enough for my fingers. Mm. And I thought, wow, well, it's 12 feet thick of ice. Uh, mm. This could be my worst nightmare. Well, maybe I did something wrong. So I went down to the bottom and then went back up again, and the same thing happened. And I, I checked my air. Oh, I still got a half hour of air. I got really good at slowly sipping the air when I was diving. And I swam over to the other diver and I signaled to her the problem I was having. She went. So I swam in the direction that she was pointing and there was the crack and I was able to get out and I was really, really happy. <laughs> <laughs> and what had happened was, I was only doing a, a dive each day, but, but these scientists, they were doing four or five dives a day and they, they were getting a little relaxed about it and casual and they hadn't noticed that the current had taken the rope from the wide part of the crack down to the narrow part of the crack. Uh -huh. So, uh, Antarctica is an incredibly dangerous place. Uh, I was in danger of losing my life almost every day. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, to me it was a big adventure, but I had to stop telling the stories to my wife because she was totally flipping out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, after a while, it was, oh, I saw penguins today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, well, I'll keep going. Uh, in the late 60s, one of the ways I, I found work is there was this uh, underground newspaper called the LA Free Press. And in the wine ads, in the back, sometimes there'd actually be art jobs. And I found this one art job that sounded real promising. It said, you know, looking for an artist who well versed in the supernatural and stuff like that. 
hey, that's right up my alley. It's like the Covenant 13 stuff I was doing. So I called up and made an appointment to show my portfolio. And it was local, it was right in Hollywood. And uh, it was a second floor apartment, knocked on the door. And this, this old guy, well at least I thought he was an old guy because I was in my 20s. So anybody over 30 looked old to me. <laughs> uh, he opened the door and bid that I come in. As soon as I stepped over the threshold, bam! It felt like I just smoked an entire ounce of hashish. <laughs> <laughs> just ripped to my gills. And I was just like trying to keep it together because to me it's like this is a job interview. And, and I, I have no idea, you know, how did that happen? And it was just be cool, just pay attention, listen to the guy. And so the guy sat down on the sofa and, and he started to talk about what he wanted. And he, I introduced himself as the head of the Los Angeles branch of the Church of Satan. Um, mm. He was friends with Anton Sandor LeBay up in San Francisco, and they wanted a, they needed a portrait of Satan. And and I look around, and there on the mantelpiece, there's black candles burning, and there's a, a an old engraving of, of Satan as a goat. And uh, there's other people in the apartment walking around, middle-aged people. And then he starts to explain the philosophy of the Church of Satan, which, uh, according to him, is exactly the same as Christianity, but with more sex. <laughs> So we agreed on a price, and uh, basically what they wanted was a big pentagram with a goat head in the center. And I got up to leave, and as soon as I stepped out, boom, my head was clear. Hmm. It was like, I, to this day, I have no idea how they pulled that one out. <laughs> bizarre. So I went back home, and for the next two weeks, I worked on the portrait, finished it, and uh, came back. You know, we had agreed, okay, come back in two weeks, same night, same place. And, Show up with the portrait in hand, knock on the door, and this young guy answers. He says, yeah, can I help you? I said, well, I'm here to deliver the portrait. He goes, no, what portrait? I go, uh, portrait of Satan. <laughs> and uh, he goes, honey, do you know anything about a portrait of Satan? And this young guy comes out. She goes, no, I don't know. I go, well, you know, it's, it's not for you guys. It's for the other people who live here. And he goes, we're the only people who live here. Hmm. We're the only people who live here for the last two years. And now I look inside, there's the sofa, there's the mantle, but there's no black candles, mm. there's no engraving. Uh, so I ended up being stuck with this portrait of Satan. Mm. <laughs> they just vanished. Bizarre. <laughs> so one of the ways I put myself through art school <laughs> is during the summer, I would paint uh, portraits at Disneyland in New Orleans mm. Square. I did watercolor portraits. And it was a great gig for an artist because uh, you got paid by commission, and I was determined to be the fastest guy there, and I was making tons of dough there. It was, it was just great. And uh, they advertised that, you know, would you like a portrait that only takes eight minutes? And when I was racing, I could get my time down to three. Hmm. And what you'd do is I had a piece of watercolor board, and I would draw with a brown or burnt umber prismacolor pencil the face, and then paint it in with the watercolor. And uh, there was another guy who, who was sort of my competitor as being the fastest guy. And one night we had a whole lot of portraits out. Well, the way it would work is people would come up to the cashier, they'd want a portrait, and they'd pay her, and she'd ask if they wanted a frame. And if they wanted a frame, they'd pay for the frame. And she'd give them a, a plastic ticket with a number on it. And then when their number gets called, they go to sit down and have their portrait done. Well, that way, with that arrangement, they could sell a whole lot of tickets. And I noticed there's about 50 tickets out. And so the other guy and I decided we're each going to try to get the most of those tickets, because that's how we count how much dough we're making by how many tickets we have at the end of the night. So we started racing. And that's when I started doing those three-minute portraits. <laughs> and we were just cranking away. Finally, after after a couple hours, because it was a really busy night, we finally got through all the portraits, and I was able to stand up for the first time. I was taking a break, and I was looking at the pictures that were being dried to put inside frames, and I saw this one of a baby. It looked like a, a head shaped sort of like a deformed potato, and it had one eye here, and one kind of drifting down, and the nose was kind of sliding that way, and the mouth was looks like it's falling off the face, and I saw that my name was signed to it. <laughs> I would love to have that portrait today. And, and, but the amazing thing is they were getting it framed. <laughs> so usually what would happen is that as soon as I finished the portrait, I handed the cashier. The cashier would show the people who bought the portrait. And 
So after the people picked up their portrait and left, I asked them, can I show? I said, uh, when you show them the portrait, what did they say? <laughs> and she said, oh, they just looked at me and said, oh my God. <laughs> 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 so I, I saw a lot of extraordinary things uh, painting portraits in Disneyland, uh, including eye color. Uh, twice in one day, I had two different people sit down, and, and I got really good at spotting contacts, so I knew these more contacts. But two people sat down had canary yellow irises, hmm. and, and other times I, I had people sit down had green eyes as green as your hat, and it was, it was amazing. This. Uh, now, our concession was different than the concession, the portrait concession on Main Street. On Main Street, they did work in pastels and they did profiles. We worked in watercolors and we did three-quarter views. So, one day, uh, a kid about 10 years old sat down and uh, he was sitting profile to me and I said, you know, just, you know, turn your head towards me so I could do a three-quarter view. And he turned his head towards me and his far eye was completely gone. It was a hollow socket. Hmm little string of flesh going from here to here. Wow. And now I could feel his parents behind me. And I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? And I tried to read their vibe from behind me. And I started slowly drawing his face with the Prismacolor pencil, saving that eye for the very last thing. And finally, it got to the point where that was the only thing left to draw in the portrait. And I just took a deep breath and made a good guess. and a perfect eye and I heard this huge sigh of relief from behind the parents mm. because that was their little boy and in their eyes he's a perfect little boy and so I, I, I felt really like I had made the right decision it was amazing I wrote that up as a, a comic book story for a Dark Horse comic story book called uh, Autobiographics. And so the best thing about that job was that when I started work, uh, my first summer there, I drew like a lot of beginning artists. It's called petting the line where you go chick, 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 as you draw. And by the end of the summer, it was absolutely confident line with no hesitation. Let's see if I can think of uh, Well, I'll I tell you, my favorite showbiz story is when I was working on Invaders from Mars. We had sent the screenplay to the Air Force because we need a lot of military gear for the film. <laughs> and it was getting closer to shooting. We hadn't heard anything back from the Air Force. We were getting nervous. And so I called him up. I said, well, you know, is the Air Force going to help us out with the making of our motion picture? And the Air Force guy said, I'm sorry, but the United States Air Force cannot cooperate in the making of your film. I said, why? You, you know, the military saves the day. You're the good guys. You know, you, you kill the Martians. You know? And he said, it is the official position of the United States Air Force that there are no Martians and there are no UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> said, oh, no, we are sunk. What are we going to do? Well, our storyboard artist, Keith Brosnan, gave me a card that says, Call this guy. And it was the card of the United States Marines Public Relations Liaison Officer. So I called him up. He said, Send me the script. So I messaged the script over. Now, this time I couldn't wait. The next day, I called him. I said, You know, the Marines can help us out with the making of our movie. He said, You will have the full cooperation of the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> so I said, So there's not a problem with the official Marines position on uh, Martians and UFOs? He said, son, it is the official position of the United States Marine Corps that the United States Marine Corps has no qualms whatsoever about killing Martians. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to know when the Martians invade and know who's going to be on the front line. <laughs> it won't be the Air Force. <laughs> so how are we, how we doing? I'm, I'm here. Oh, plenty of time. Okay, I guess I've been talking too fast. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's it like living in Antarctica? Oh, living in Antarctica, it's it's really it's really interesting. McMurdo Station, our biggest station, I said had twelve has twelve hundred people during the Antarctic summer, and it's sort of a cross between uh, college dorms 
uh, a ski lodge and a military station. Except uh, I, I felt that strongly all the time I was there. Except I kept thinking, there's something missing though. There's something missing that all three of those things have, but it's not here. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And then it dawned on me, oh, there's no visual references anywhere to sex. Because of the ratio of guys to gals there, it's so extreme. There, a woman came up to me and she said, you know, Bill, there's two kinds of women in Antarctica. There are beautiful women, and there are women who are beautiful while they're in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> and they call them the ice queens. And uh, they, it's, it's, it becomes such a tense subject, that's why there are no visuals anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time we were in, they have several movie rooms where you can watch videos and stuff. And this one gal just sort of absent mindedly started giving the guy in front of her shoulder up. And you could cut the tension in that room with a knife. Every single guy was like, why isn't that me? Because <laughs> you're in a, a room, a whole station full of alpha males. There's a 4,000 person waiting list to uh, be the support personnel for, for the scientists down there. So that means they have the pick of the finest people in the world. The guy washing dishes in the kitchen has got five PhDs. The guy flipping pancakes on the grill, he's been to the top of Everest seven times. Every single person is like that. It's the most extraordinary group of people on the planet. If, if you want to read about that, there's a great book called Icebound, written by an Antarctic doctor who had decided to win her over. And just as the last plane was leaving, point of no return, no more planes until uh, the winter was over, she diagnosed herself with breast cancer and decided to operate on herself using the Antarctic personnel to assist. It's an amazing book. But the first two thirds of the book are just about how extraordinary the people are that are down there. So one of the, the other grantee that got the grant when I was down there was a, a, a brilliant photographer named Galen Roll, famous for shooting uh, pictures of Yosemite and the Himalayas and Tibet. Uh, he's a world-class mountain climber, and he's the kind of guy that if the perfect shot requires him to hang eight stories in, in the air from a, a little rope to get that shot, he'll do that. Huh. And uh, he took me on a lot of his, his uh, photo trips with him, and I learned a lot about photography from him. He was just really amazing and unbelievably fit. He was 10 years older than me, and he could run me into the ground. He's just an amazing guy. Uh, the food in Antarctica is incredible. Uh, and when I was at Palmer Station, the, the chef has Sundays off, and they ask people who are at the station to volunteer to cook dinner on Sundays. And so I, I used to work in a Mexican restaurant, and I was a, a prep chef, so I knew a lot of uh, how to cook Mexican food, but I thought, well, they're not going to have what I need here. But I wanted to make chili verde burritos and soft tostadas and, and uh, flan. And I, I looked in the storage and everything was there. They had big flour tortillas, they had avocados, mm -hmm. they had all the, everything I needed to, to make those dishes. And uh, yeah, the food's extraordinary. I mean, you can eat there 24 7. The sun during the Antarctic summer, is, it looks like it's 10 a.m. and it just goes around in a circle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't set. And uh, you see things called sun dogs, uh, which you also see up in, in Alaska. And that's where the sun has a big halo around it. And at both ends of the halo are, are two little suns. Mm. Weird stuff down there. I went down to uh, one of the dry valleys with the paleontologist who had found this boulder where it shouldn't have been. Basically, it was a Mesozoic area, but it was a Cenozoic boulder, a big sandstone boulder from, uh, oh gosh, I think about 40 million years ago. And he was really interested as, as to why this was here. This was sort of an anomaly. And he brought two guys with him. And with a jackhammer, they, they split the rock open. And inside was a perfectly preserved branch. It was not fossilized. It was still wood from 40 million years ago. Uh, of a, uh, it was a southern beech tree. And I was talking to some of the scientists. They said, yeah, down below the ice, if you drill down, there are green leaves from the forest that used to be in Antarctica mm -hmm. millions of years ago that have just been covered and pressed down with the ice. 
the, the ice is so thick in the center of Antarctica that if the ice melts, and, and the ice is melting, uh, the, the ice, pressure of that ice is pushed down the center of the continent, down below sea level. So if that ice melts, Antarctica will end up being two big islands hmm. with a big strait uh, down the center. Up at the top of Erebus, Mount Erebus, the volcano I climbed, uh, there are these crystals, millions of these crystals called Kenyite. They're only found in two places in the world, on the top of Mount Erebus and the top of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. And they're feldspar crystals, and uh, you can use them like mining at the station because they're really highly sought after because very few people get to go to the top of Erebus. Coincidentally, I also went to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, it was, I, when I got married, my wife and I decided we would honeymoon in East Africa and the Seychelles Islands. But uh, I saw that there was a possibility to climb Kilimanjaro, so I left a couple weeks before my wife to climb the mountain. It's the tallest mountain in the African continent, and it sits right on the equator. In fact, for many, many decades uh, after Kilimanjaro was discovered, uh, most of the geographers did not believe that uh, the people who discovered Kilimanjaro were telling the truth. They said it was impossible for there to be a snow-capped mountain on the equator, but eventually they were proved wrong. Uh, my travel agent messed up, and I was supposed to have six days to go up and down the mountain. And uh, I ended up having, uh, basically, you either do it three days or you don't do it at all. So I thought, well, mm. I'll take a chance. What happens when you when you rush like that is you run, you greatly increase your risk of altitude sickness. Uh, so much so that uh, all the, the Italians and the Germans and the Swiss and the other people who were climbing the mountains at the same time as me had a pool as to when I was going to drop. <laughs> so you, it's an amazing climb. You start out in the middle of uh, sugarcane and banana plantations, and then you get to the, the gates of the park, and it's it's thick moist jungles and, and rainforest and and actually that's one of the hardest parts of the climb is even though you, you know you're not at any altitude or anything uh, these trees have these gigantic roots and you have to step way high over them so after several hours of doing that the tops of my legs were just burning like they've been hit by a hot iron but I knew I had to keep going because I had a really limited time. They have a couple huts that you stay in on the way up. And uh, the extraordinary thing to me about the climb was how distinct the zones were, the, the plant zones. It was almost like you could see the line. It didn't like fade or merge. It was very distinctive lines between the different zones as you're going up. And eventually you get uh, beyond vegetation where it's like being on the moon. It's just stones and rocks. Nothing can grow there and it's 100 degrees in the sunshine and below freezing in the shadows. So there's water flowing and then there'd be icicles. It's unbelievable. So you make your final ascent to the mountain uh, beginning at 1 a.m. And, and that's uh, it's a 2,000 foot climb from, from that last hut. And the reason you do that is you want to be at the top to see the sunrise from the top of Kilimanjaro. And what I didn't know was uh, about the flashlight. My guide was supposed to bring a heavy duty flashlight with him, but he was poor, he didn't have one. And so he asked me if I had a flashlight. And I thought, oh yeah, sure, and I gave him this little pen light. And we <laughs> proceeded to make the climb with this little tiny pen light. Uh, well, after a very short time, the battery died on the pen light because it was so cold. It was, uh, I think it was minus 20 degrees. Hmm. And so we we're climbing around in the dark, and we're climbing up this stuff called scree, which is very loose rock where you take uh, three steps up and slide two down. Mm. And, and after a while of doing this and, and being completely, I mean, I could see my hand this close, but I couldn't see it that close. <coughs> I thought, uh, we're probably going to die here. We're probably going to step off the cliff I don't even see. And mm. just, and so I, I better do something. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're both going to perish. And so I got down on my hands and knees and I started crawling around and I found a little tiny pocket in the rocks, uh, just big enough for the two of us. Because I, I knew we couldn't keep going up, we'd probably die. We couldn't go down because that would be even worse because then we'd have momentum. <laughs> uh, if we just stayed still, we would just freeze to death because it was minus 20. But I found this little pocket in the rocks and so I climbed in, I pulled him in, and then we just huddled for warmth in the pocket 
kept all our, our body heat inside and it kept it warm enough for us to survive until the sun came out. And I saw, I saw the pink of dawn and I, I pushed him out and I got out and I looked and we were just three yards from the top of the mountain. I went up, hmm. tagged the pole, took snapshots. By that time, my, my guide had uh, altitude sickness. Hmm. And I said, uh, uh, we're going down. He said, oh, better go. <laughs> and, and we just shot down that mountain. And uh, hmm. I don't know if it's been broken, but at the time I held the record for record time for climbing Kilimanjaro and coming back down. Hmm. And the weird thing was, now this is a, a, a country where it's, it's nearly impossible to phone the next village. I mean, the, the phone system is just unbelievably poor. I, I got down and walked into a hotel and in, into an elevator and and uh, two very well-dressed African gentlemen said, oh, oh, we heard about you. You were the young man who climbed the club and draw in three days. Congratulations. That's <laughs> I'm going, how did you guys find this out? You're, you're in Arusha, which is a city that was like an hour drive away. And that is bizarre. And then my wife got there with, with the group that we we're going to tour East Africa with, and they already knew that I'd gone up and down okay. And hmm. I, I just guess it's jungle drums. <laughs> <laughs> Very bizarre. So one of the neatest trips I took was, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Art Nouveau artist Alphonse Mucha. Hmm. Uh, he was pretty much the artist who defined Art Nouveau, that, that entire style of, uh, based upon organic forms. With, uh, he, he did the, the job cigarette girl posters with this sort of spaghetti-like hair. And uh, extraordinary guy. His masterpieces, though, are considered the Slav epic murals. There are 24 gigantic murals, each one taller than this wall. Huge, huge paintings. And I tried to see them in 1980. 1980, I, I left the Conan film to do my dinosaur book. Uh, but I, since I was in Europe, we, were, we started out shooting in, uh, in Yugoslavia. I was there when, when Tito died. And then uh, we moved the production to Madrid, and then we shot the film in Spain. But I thought, as long as I'm in Europe, I'll do research for my dinosaur book. And I, I went to some of the great natural history museums around the European continent. And one of the places I went to was Prague. Uh, and I, I wanted to go there because I wanted to see the Alphonse Mucha paintings. And I wanted to see uh, Zdeněk Burian's paintings. He was a great paleo artist who was still living at the time. And uh, unfortunately, he was on vacation when I got to Prague. And the Soviets, uh, Czechoslovakia was still under Soviet rule, so they had removed all Mukas from display and all Burian paintings from display to discourage Czech nationalism. So I didn't get a chance to see any of the stuff that I wanted to see that I went to Prague for. However, I went back to Prague two years ago and uh, I left my uh, family in Prague. I said, you guys go see the castle today. I'm going to go see the Slav epic murals. And so I got on a, I took a five hour bus trip, which was not easy because I had to go from Prague to Brno and then Brno to a little tiny village called Moroski Kulov where the murals were, but uh, I speak very little Czech, and uh, fortunately there were a lot of you know, Czech students there who spoke English who were helping me out, otherwise I, I never would have made it. And I got to this little village, and they have all the paintings up in this monastery, and I was able to get this close to them, and I literally was pinching myself the whole time because I thought, I must be dreaming, because this is something I'd want us to see for so many, many years. And, and here they all were, and I could get as close as I wanted to them. They were absolutely extraordinary. And then I, I spent several hours perusing all the paintings and then walked out back out to the plaza where the, the bus had dropped me off, and it was completely vacant. There were no buses. And I thought, oh, wow, how do we get back to Prague? <laughs> and uh, I finally found a, a young waitress who, who spoke English, and she was able to figure out where I needed to go, that there was one bus left. It wasn't going to take me back to Prague, but it would take me to the train station, and then I could jump on a train and go to Prague. And so that, that was how I got back. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting adventure. <laughs> yes? Go back to your, your Disney days. Uh -huh. When you were there, uh, what stopped you from trying to like get into the Imagineering or you know, any of that creative aspect of the, the park? Oh, well. I was working at, at the park, and I wasn't working directly for Disney. Uh, the, the watercolor portrait 
concession, the silhouette concession, and the caricatures out in front of Small World were all owned by a, a company called the Rubio Company, and that's why I worked for them. They leased those spots from Disneyland. So I wasn't actually working for Disneyland. And, and you have to realize, Disney is, a, is several companies. So the Disneyland people don't interact with the Imagineering people. They don't interact with the people making the animated movies. They don't interact with the people making the live action movies. They're all separate companies, really. But I did end up getting hired by Walt Disney Imagineering. Oh, although I should, I should tell you why I was banned for life from Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you bust out. <laughs> so it was uh, my second summer there. It was the middle of the summer. and. Uh, uh, I had I had hair down to about here, but I was wearing a short hair wig on the job. <laughs> yeah. And there was this cashier that I really liked. She was just a, a wonderful gal. And an older cashier who, who had used to work for the Rubio company came back and asked for a job. And they just fired this other girl and gave her her job. And I'm thinking, it's obvious. Where in the hell is this gal going to find summer work? I mean, they totally screwed her. It was terrible. I was really angry. And about that time, someone from Disneyland noticed a little bit of my hair peeking out from under the wave. Hmm. And so the, the edict came out, you've got to cut your hair. And I said, no. You, you don't understand. You'll lose your job if you don't cut your hair. I said, well, I'm not cutting it. And so my boss got really angry because I was his top earner. And so he made it very difficult for me to get my last paycheck. He mm -hmm. made me actually pay admission to come into the park <laughs> to pick up the check. So I thought, well, once I picked up the check, I thought, well, as long as I paid admission, I'm here. I'll go see all my old friends and, and you know, just say goodbye to them and stuff. I went to the hat shop that was near where the portraits were, and the hat shop girl, she said, you got to get out of here fast. They're setting you up for an arrest. I go, what? I haven't done anything. How can they arrest me? And suddenly, here comes Disney security with my old boss with a big grin on his face. And they arrested me and took me back to security. And I said, uh, you know, what am I being arrested for? He says, we are not at liberty to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that's not fair. He goes, no, there's a lot of things in life that aren't fair. <laughs> and so they, they set me in the holding room, and it, I got to see the big, gigantic array of all the video screens where they're watching all of you while you're at Disneyland. And uh, a guy came out and he said, uh, you know, I'm here to inform you that you, may, you are no longer welcome to Disneyland. You may never come here again. If you come here again, it will be trespassing under Anaheim Municipal Code XXX and stuff. And I said, what did I do? He said, uh, we have a report uh, from the silhouette guy that uh, you committed an obscenity. I go, really? What did I do? <laughs> He says, or oh, not at liberty to tell you. <laughs> I said, well, have the guy come over. I'd like to ask him what he thought I did. He said, well, he's busy at work. We can't take him away from his work. I said, now, uh, this officer here is to escort you out of the park to make sure that you leave in your vehicle. Uh, but before we do so, uh, we need to stamp your hands with the invisible X's. And I went, what? <laughs> and they, they said, put up your hands. So I put up my hands and they took a, a rubber stamp and they stamped invisible X's on my hands that show up under a black light. Unfortunately, they're not still there to this day. <laughs> but, so they escorted me out of the park and uh, I was permanently banned from Disneyland. Well, many years later, in the, in the 80s, about 1986, uh, I get a call from Walt Disney Imagineering. They want to hire me to design this project. And so I came in and I started working as a full-time consultant for Walt Disney Imagineering. I worked there a couple of years and then off and on between bouncing back and forth between the Imagineers and Universal for many years. It was my main source of income for a while. But at one point they said, oh, uh, today, uh, yeah, we got to go to the park, we got to go to Disney. And I go, oh, wait, guys, you can't go. I said, what are you talking about? You can't go. I said, and I told them, sorry, get in the car. <laughs> Actually, after I was banned from Disneyland, I did come back a month later in disguise <laughs> with, with my brother and, and my band. And mm. I had on the disguise with the big cornrow glasses with the bushy eyebrows and the huge nose and the big black <laughs> <laughs> not Not too subtle. 
but, but it worked. Nobody recognized me. And so we, I had them snap pictures of me all over Disneyland wearing that disguise. So, but uh, I like working at Walt Disney Imagineering. That was, uh, I, they did not limit me in what I wanted to do. I was able to write projects, design projects, produce projects, direct projects. Uh, I worked out uh, a deal that became known as the Stout Deal, uh, which was, we were negotiating, we already negotiated my weekly rate, and, uh, and I said, oh, one other thing, it's, it's uh, my corporate policy that uh, my corporation owns and retains all the original artwork. And they said, well, it's Disney's policy that Disney owns and retains all the original artwork. I said, well, we're two smart guys, let's work this out. And I said, here, here's what we'll do. Every two weeks, I'll make a list of every picture I've painted or drawn, and I'll price it fairly according to current market value. If you want to buy them, you can buy them. If not, they're mine. And they said, oh, that sounds reasonable. So they ended up buying everything, which meant I had several of my <laughs> best years ever. <laughs> 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 cool. How are we doing? Oh, it's, it's time. Any, any last question? You have a moment. Go ahead. OK, yes? What, uh, what brought, uh, did you work on rides or did you work on shows? I designed uh, ride. I designed. Uh, I was a designer on the Indiana Jones ride. On, uh, I was a designer on Toontown. I designed restaurants for them. I designed nightclubs for them. I designed uh, the comedy club uh, at Pleasure Island for them. Uh, I designed an entire second gate park uh, for Tokyo. Uh, and I uh, designed uh, in shops, I designed shops for them. Uh, the first big job I had was designing something called Disney Island. Uh, they had a problem in that uh, when Epcot would close, people would leave the property, go into Orlando and spend their money. They wanted to, they said, design something that keeps people off property. So it, it has to have shops and entertainment and, and restaurants. And so I, I, I did. And uh, it was, we came up, my team and I came up with the most, what they said was the most spectacular presentation they'd ever seen at Walt Disney Imagineering. They were bringing people in all over from town to see this thing. Uh, at the time, John Jurdy, an architect uh, in Los Angeles, was working for Disney and he saw it. And eventually they, I, I said, well, okay, so when do we start building? He said, uh, we're not going to build it. I said, why? He said, well, no one would come. And, uh, and it'd be too expensive. I said, what do you mean too expensive? You didn't give me a budget. You give me a budget, I'll work to your budget, and I'll make sure it comes in on time, under schedule. And they say, yeah, but no, nobody would come to it. So I thought, yeah, people are nuts. Okay, flash forward, many years later, I'm hired to, by Steven Spielberg to design the GameWorks Clubs. And the guy who, who hires me, is one of the guys who was my tech expert on the Disney Island presentation. He finds out I've never been to City Walk. He says, Bill, we're going right now. I go, why? He says, I just want to see the expression on your face. <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay, so we, walk, we go up to City Walk and I go, oh my God, <laughs> they built Disney Island. <laughs> and it's packed. And I felt so vindicated, like, yeah, they built it exactly the way I designed it. And because John Jurdy is the guy who built City Watch. He left Disney shortly after that and went to Universal and pitched them, and that's that's how it got built. That's hmm. so extraordinary. Well, thanks everybody. <laughs> I'll be at the Watch Studios booth uh, 305, and I'll have books there and re-signing and stuff. You want to have a lot of